Hello, this is David Scher. I'm back for Physics 572, Introduction to Health Physics. We've uh, completed our first midterm exam. Uh, we have That exam covered the first segment of the course, which was about uh, basic science topics, radiation physics and radiation biology, uh, that set the stage for the application uh, for applications in health physics. Uh, health physics is, of course, the uh, science and art of radiation protection. Uh, and uh, now we're going to turn to topics that uh, establish the basis for the profession. First, we're going to talk about external dosimetry as the first topic. Uh, dosimetry is uh, the measure or calculations of uh, radiation levels so that we can, um, and we use those measurements or calculations to establish a basis for protecting people from uh, the risks of radiation. So we will uh, talk about the, the techniques and, and, and science underlying uh, measurements of radiation. So let's first talk about radiation dose uh, absorbed dose from charged particles. Um, so uh, we've already learned that the stopping power is the energy loss per unit length, or DEDX. The mass stopping power is the energy loss per aerial, ma uh, aerial mass. So it's S over rho, just simply divide by the physical mass of the um, of the material. Um, only uh, uh, collisional losses deposit uh, energy locally. Radiative losses carry energy away to other areas. So if we have a small volume, as shown on the right, uh, an infinitesimal volume, if you will, that uh, where we're trying to assess how much energy is being deposited per unit mass, then uh, when there are uh, radiative losses, Bram strong events, in the as the electron moves along its path, that energy is carried out as a photon. It's carried out of the region, out of the, the small volume, and doesn't add to the uh, stopping power uh, locally. It doesn't add to the, the energy deposited locally. So let's uh, look at absorbed dose. Let's try to get a sense of what quantities uh, contribute to the mass, per, uh, the energy deposited per unit mass. So let's look at a, a beam of electrons or charged particles that are coming in from the left of the cube, and they're characterized by a, a fluence. So there are phi particles per unit area. So um, there's just some number of particles per unit area that's represented by phi. So what are the number that are passing into meet the surface on the left side of the, the cube? Well, that would be phi times the area, or phi times dx times dz. Uh, excuse me, dy times dz. Th those are the, the two dimensions that are perpendicular to the beam of um, charged particles. How much energy does this particle uh, deposit? Well, it's the energy per unit length times the length that passes. So it would be s times dx. They pass through the, the, the medium uh, in the direction of dx. And what is the mass of the cube? Well, that's the density times the volume. Rho times dx times dy times dz. That would be the mass of the cube. So what is the energy deposited per unit mass? Well, it's the number of electrons uh, times the energy deposited per electron divided by the mass. So from the previous slide, that's the flux, the fluence, number of particles per square centimeter times dx, excuse me, dy dz. The energy deposited is s times dx, and the mass is rho times dx dy dz. All these differentials cancel out, and so the energy deposited per unit mass is simply phi, the fluence, times s over rho, the restricted mass stopping power. So this is our simple formula. And, and, and this cube is intended to illustrate, why, uh, motivate why it's true, why, why it makes sense. Okay, so let's talk about charged particle equilibrium now. As we, um, the, considering some infinitesimal volume, uh, 
it's entirely possible that some of the electrons uh, might, uh, their entire, their range might end up outside of the volume. They might, some of them might pass through the entire volume we're, we're looking at, some might go, uh, move out the edges, etc. So um, how does that affect the, the uh, energy deposition? I said, assumed it, there, it's a, uh, it's a very small cube and they're just, electrons are just passing right through. Well, e even if we consider this possibility, uh, let's look at neighboring, uh, uh, infinitesimal volumes. Uh, for every electron that's coming out of the backside, there's an electron entering this second layer. So, uh, very quickly with charged particles, uh, you get to a point where there's equilibrium. There are losses. We want every uh, cell that loses a, an electron out the left, out the bottom. There's a, another a neighboring cell that's uh, having uh, scattering electrons, replacing them, entering in from, from the uh, the cell. So very quickly with charged particles, uh, you you end up in a situation of electronic equilibrium. The electrons lost from a, a differential cell, uh, infinitesimal cell, are replaced by electrons being lost by neighboring cells. So on the whole, uh, our, our formula still works. Okay, uh, as I said, equilibrium, this, this achievement of, of a balance is easy with charged particles uh, because they transfer energy uh, immediately when they enter a medium. It's going to be more complicated when we talk with, about photons or other indirectly ionizing radiation, because in that case, photons might pass through the first few layers and you'll have new electrons being created deeper into the uh, medium. So we'll deal with that. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, so now let's talk about, so we have a very simple formula for uh, charged particle equilibrium. The, Absorbed dose is simply phi times the mass stopping power. Now, um, how about uh, absorbed dose from photons? Well, we know the interactions that are going to deposit energy. There's a photoelectric effect, Compton effect, and pair production. And we know, we've spent a good deal of time going over the basic science for this, we know that there's an attenuation coefficient, mu, that gives us a fraction of photons that interact per unit distance. So here we have um, an example of, um, suppose we have a, a attenuation constant of 0.1 per centimeter. Well, then uh, photons uh, in one seated per centimeter material, the fraction that's lost is 0.1. So 10% of 100, 10 photons are absorbed in that uh, area. And then there's 90 photons that would pass through. Now this is an idealization it's actually uh, a rate. And so this is only true for the very um, first uh, 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 infinitesimally small volume. Uh, the photon uh, fluence continuously decreases in an exponential fashion. So in this case, let's see, uh, let me see if I can find a web browser. Here we go. Um, let's go here. Actually, if we're talking about, uh, I'm going to do some calculations for you. E to the minus, well, it's right there. I did this already. So E to the minus 0.1 is mu, right? There's 0.1 and there's one centimeter. Well, then in reality, instead of being 0.9, E to the minus 0.1 is 0.905. So it's a little bit um, uh, more uh, than, than you would have done if we just did it algebraically. So... That is where we are. Um, it, it, but think of it as a rate like um, if someone can run 20 miles an hour, that doesn't mean they're going to run 20 miles in an hour. Uh, it's um, going to be uh, very difficult for, uh, you know, the, the, to sustain it for that long. So let's see, this is what we're looking at. Um, but the rate, the instantaneous rate for the, the, the small distance is 0.1, 10%. Per centimeter, if you did it as a millimeter, it would be 1% per millimeter. If you did it as a micron, it would be 10 to the minus 4 per micron. But um, the, the rate is still constant with all those different unit changes. Okay. Um,
So we know what the attenuation coefficient is. We've talked about all those different uh, uh, processes before. We have photoelectric effect, we have Compton scattering, we have pair production. Now, the attenuation constant, attenuation coefficient, tells us how many particles interact per unit length, how many photons are, are going, undergoing interaction per unit length. Um, uh, and, and all these different uh, processes are, are dependent on the material you're in and on the energy. Okay, so these are things we're familiar with, uh, but they were going to help us uh, with um, uh, the uh, energy deposited. So we know how many photons are, are present. What fraction of the energy is deposited in each of these interactions? Well, for the photoelectric effect, uh, it's the photon energy minus the binding energy of the electron divided by the photon energy. So that's how much energy is absorbed. Some energy, um, the, that's what's transferred to the electron. The electron is ejected from the atom with that energy, and that's the fraction. that When you divide by the incident energy, that's the fraction of energy absorbed. For the Compton effect, we had the uh, incident photon energy minus the scattered photon energy divided by the incident photon energy. That's the fraction of energy that is uh, deposited by charged particles in the material. For the photoelectric effect, you have the uh, incident photon energy minus two times the rest mass of the electron. It has to create a, a, an electron and a positron. So two me, uh, mc squared for the mass of the electron divided by the initial energy. That's a fraction that's um, uh, deposited. So the, the attenuation coefficient was the fraction of the number of photons that interact. Uh, now we're going to come up with a new coefficient called the energy transfer coefficient. We have the probability of an interaction by the photoelectric effect times the fraction of energy deposited for, by the photoelectric effect. The probability of a Compton scattering times the uh, fraction of energy deposited in a Compton scatter. The probability of pair production times a fraction of energy transferred in pair production. So all this gives us the probability that energy will be transferred to charged particles in the material. So this is our, what's called the energy transfer coefficient. Uh, we have another concept, but see, once energy is transferred to these electrons, uh, they, they go through the material and the electrons, the secondary electrons that were uh, uh, created by the photons, they interact with the material and a, a fraction of their energy might be transferred to uh, Bremsstrahlen. You could have a, a high energy interaction and the electro, a photoelectron can have enough high, high enough energy that it can undergo Bremsstrahlen. And if it undergoes Bremsstrahlen, the photon energy is not deposited locally, it's, it's sent off in the distance. And so uh, we also have to take account of the fact that primary electrons, uh, excuse me, that um, secondary electrons uh, could also lose energy uh, that's not deposited locally. But the, the collisional uh, stop, uh, uh, losses by the secondary electrons are all local. Okay, and so we have this concept, uh, this uh, fraction G, which would be a fraction of energy that is transferred into Bremsstrahlen. And we have a new, con a new coefficient we we're going to define, the energy absorption coefficient. It's the um, uh, energy transfer coefficient times 1 minus G. Now notice this is the, the radiative stopping power. This is the collisional stopping power. The radiative stopping power is an order of magnitude below the collisional stopping power in water, even at 10 MeV. So it takes very high energy uh, 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 electrons, and therefore very high energy photons, uh, to um, even have uh, uh, for this G to be significant. It's really important at very high energies. And, and, and at relatively low energies, below an MeV, below 10 MeV, say, uh, the energy uh, coefficient, energy absorption coefficient, 
is almost identical with the um, energy transfer coefficient. Okay, so here are our ratios. Now, we did a homework problem where we uh, looked at the energy of a uh, 1 MeV photon and compared it with the binding energy of, I think it was lead, and it was a very small fraction. So in practical terms, when we talk about energy transferred by the photoelectric effect, it, the um, binding energy is usually negligible and the ratio, all of the energy essentially is absorbed uh, in the transfer coefficient. We calculated, we did some uh, problems for the Compton effect, where we asked you to calculate how much energy was imparted to an electron, that's E gamma minus E gamma prime. So that's been a, a homework problem you've done. And we know what the rest mass electron is. This is simply 1.022 MeV, and you know how to do that uh, calculation. So these are pretty straightforward. Now let's do an example calculation uh, to, to determine the mass energy coefficient with all these concepts we've learned. So we're going to calculate the, the energy absorption co um, coefficient at 100 keV. I'm choosing 100 keV because I see on this graph that's the, where the energy absorption uh, is most different from the attenuation coefficient. So that it will be of interest to us. So I just picked that as a um, instructive uh, example, but it could be done for any any energy along here. So I, I went and found there's a website that shows us the cross sections for photo photo cross sections. It's XCOM from the National Institute of, of Standards and Technology. It's a reliable source. Uh, so I went to that website. Let's see if I can do that now. Here, oh, there we go. Go to XCOM 3R. I um, go to the database uh, search form. And I say I'm interested in a compound. I'm interested, uh, so I'm going to submit that information. What compound? Well, let's find out about the, the question we're looking into is for water. Uh, and we were going to do it at 0 0.1 MeV, okay? And we are interested in all kinds of graphs, aren't we? Photoelectric. There's not going to be pair production at 0.1 MeV, so I'm not going to uh, include that. Okay, so what we get back, uh, I'm able to parse the form. What did I do wrong? Oh, maybe that's it. So let's submit that. Here we go. Here's our data. This data looks very much like the graph we had before. Uh, it's just the scales are different. So what we're looking at is at 0.1 MeV. Here are all of the different scattering and photoelectric cross sections. So we have that data. Let's go back to our slide. And we have, uh, these are the numbers from that graph for coherent scattering. It was 5.349 E minus three for Compton scattering is 1.626 E minus one photoelectric effect. It, it's on the slide here. You can see it. I don't need to read it to you. And so we're going to calculate this now. Um, like, as I said before, the energy, uh, essentially all of the energy is transferred. Was, okay. For, um, Raleigh scattering, coherent scattering, no energy is transferred. That's what's meant by coherent. Uh, for Compton scattering, we have to ca calculate what fraction of the energy is transferred. Photoelectric absorption, we assume that all of the energy is transferred to the electron. The binding energy in hydrogen and oxygen is tiny compared to 100 keV. So it'll be less than a rounding error. So let's look at our slide to do the Compton scattering. The formula for the energy of the uh, secondary electron depends on a scattering angle. This is what the cross-section as a function of angles look like. And so the, the higher the energy is, the, the more forward peaked at zero degrees. Uh, and so this uh, is a half of mc squared, so 250 or 256 uh, 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 
thousand electron volts, and we're looking at a hundred uh, thousand electron volts. So um, we're going to say that the that it will average out the for the the weighted average of all this will be eighty five degrees or eighty degrees, well, one point four radians. And so I use the formula that we know for what is the uh, energy of the scattered photon, get the, the fraction of energy transferred to the electron from the incident um, photon. We did this as a homework problem, and I plugged in all the numbers, and I got 0.1396 as the fraction of energy that's transferred to electrons. So let's figure out the energy transfer coefficient, photoelectric effect. All of it is transferred, attenuation coefficient that we got from the NIST website. So here's what the energy of its contribution to the energy absorption coefficient. Compton scattering, I calculated with 0.1396, the attenuation coefficient that I got from the NIST. And so that means this, this is the fraction absorbed. Rayleigh scattering, no energy is transferred. And so the absorption is zero. And I add all these up, I get 0.1707 as the attenuation coefficient, 0.0252, or 0.0255 as the absorption coefficient. Well, we go back to the NIST database for mass attenuation. We've used it a few times. I um, compared my results to theirs. They have 0.1707 uh, square centimeters per gram. So we did all right for attenuation. We should because we're getting it from the same source. We're getting it from the NIST database. And we did pretty good for the attenuated the absor energy absorption coefficient. Uh, they've got 0 0.02546. We've got 0 0.0255. That's uh, great. So uh, we've learned how to uh, how someone goes about calculating the energy absorption coefficient, given information about the um, there we go the attenuation coefficient. That's the concept that comes about. Now we have a graph. Um, we have available to us data with the mass uh, energy absorption coefficient. So we'll just look them up. Other than uh, this uh, um, equal, we're learning about how the concepts, we might calculate one of these as homework, but we can look up the energy absorption coefficients directly in order to calculate them ourselves. I think there will be a homework problem where you're going to be going through the kind of exercise I did here. Okay. Um, now, once we know the fraction of photon energy that's absorbed locally, what do we do with that? Well, there's a couple of concepts we need to talk about. One is called KERMA. It's an abbreviation or acronym or portmanteau for kinetic energy released in material. So it's only defined for uncharged radiation, so um, indirectly ionizing radiation. There is no such thing as karma for a charged particle. Um, karma includes all the energy transferred to the charged particles in a test volume. So if photon comes in and it undergoes Compton scattering, the energy that's transferred to the charged particle would be included in the karma the secondary photon would not be. If a uh, photon comes in, undergoes uh, photoelectric absorption, the energy that's uh, deposited, that's imparted, would be included in the karma. Uh, and if you have uh, uh, a photon that comes in and undergoes uh, a Bremsstrahlung event, and the Bremsstrahlung event takes place outside of the uh, event, outside of the area, well, inside the area for that matter, it's the initial energy that's transferred as kinetic energy is counted in the KERMA. So in the KERMA, even the Bremsstrahlung would be included. It's all of the energy deposited by each of these photons divided by the mass of this segment. Um, okay. That's the concept of KERMA. Now, how do we, how does KERMA uh, relate to the energy absorption coefficient? Well, how many photons are entering the area? Well, it's the fluence, number of photons per square centimeter, times the cross-sectional area, uh, dy, dz, just like we had for the charged particles. Each photon carries an energy E, 
let's assume they're all the same energy. The fraction of energy transferred is mu times dx. Um, mu is the probability of energy absorption. dx is per unit length. dx is the, you know, the length of this cube. And the mass of the cube, once again, is rho dx dy dz. So the differentials, once again, uh, calc cancel out, just like they did for the charged particles. And the kerma is phi, the uh, fluence, the particles per unit area, times the energy of the, of the photons, times mu tr over rho. And for low energy, mu tr is equal to mu en. So that's what the kerma is. Now we have another concept we need to introduce, and that is the concept of absorbed dose. Uh, kerma was the energy transferred, um, and uh, absorbed dose is, as the name applies, the energy that's absorbed in our little volume. So as, as a secondary electron is created, uh, a secondary electron might be created outside of the volume. In kerma, if it's created outside of the volume, we didn't count it. In absorbed dose, if it's created outside of the volume, but it passes through the volume, we have to count all that energy that's being deposited. Um, electrons that are uh, um, that receive energy in the volume, we only want the energy that's deposited in the volume. We don't want to include the energy that is uh, deposited outside of the volume, etc. So it's just the energy uh, as the electrons pass through the, the volume divided by the mass of the volume. Okay, that's the concept. It's the energy that's absorbed in our little test volume. Now, this is very difficult to calculate, uh, both in general. Uh, how do we know what fraction of the charged particles range went through our little mass? Um, so it's very difficult. It's relatively easy to measure. I just take some device that measures energy deposition. It could be a calorimeter. I measure the temperature increase divided by the mass and, and it uses specific heat. It could be uh, some other instrument that measures the energy that's being deposited per um, unit mass. Uh, but it's uh, relatively easy to measure, relatively hard to calculate to know what all these different uh, um, amounts are. However, uh, under conditions of electron equilibrium, charged particle equilibrium, then just like we had for the electrons, if this is deep enough in the material, for every charged particle is, that's leaving the volume, there's a, a, a equivalent charged particle entering the volume on average over the, the mass of the object. And so those all balance out. And if you go, so if you go uh, to a, a point of charged particle equilibrium, then uh, kerma and absorbed dose are relatively the same. In that case, then the absorbed dose is phi, the particles per square centimeter, the energy uh, carried by each photon times the energy absorption coefficient divided by rho, the mass energy absorption coefficient. So it's a relatively simple formula once again. And this is the concept about why this is the case. Now, let's talk about charged particle equilibrium and how that karma and absorbed dose are related. So on the top, we're, we've got, let's depict our stacks of infinitesimal cells, of small cells of material. There are a hundred, uh, in, in the first cell, a uh, hundred charged particles are ejected, are emitted. Uh, but very little of the energy is absorbed in the first cell. So the kerma is these hundred charged particles and the average energy per particle is relatively high. Um, in, the, in cell two, 5% of the um, uh, photons are lost because they're uh, absorbed in, in cell one. So 95 particles are created and they pass a distance. So we've got the, the particles that occurred from um, cell one that enter cell two plus the, cell, the, the particles that are generated in cell two and are lost. Uh, in cell three, there are 90 uh, charged particles created. It's some, we have particles that are entering, particles that are losing. So here we had two sets of particles. Here we have three sets of particles. And notice that those, the range of the particles from cell one and in, in cell four. So we have three in cell three, three in cell four, three of these lines in cell five. We have fewer and fewer being created, but the total number of um, particles that are uh, coming in from the 
at, at, we get to this point, the particles are coming in from the superficial uh, cells, balance the, the electrons that are lost to deeper cells. We've reached charged particle equilibrium. So karma, the, the energy that was imparted in, in the cell, starts off very high and then begins to decrease because of attenuation. For absorbed dose, little of the energy is absorbed in the, in the very first layer, but as charged particles begin to balance, where we, the, the charge the particles that are lost um, uh, contribute to deeper cells, then the energy deposited increases. And the, at a certain point, it would build up as a, a, a reached, when, when, when you reach equilibrium, then the uh, number of particles or the energy that's lost from particles that escape the region are balanced by uh, charged particles that are entering the region. And that's when we reach charged particle equilibrium and the absorbed dose and the karma uh, are very close to each other and they're parallel. Um, as I said, this phenomenon of the, the absorbed dose increasing is called buildup. Buildup, is, uh, the equilibrium thickness is equal to the range of secondary particles because that's how far charged particles are traveling and they might contribute to dose uh, that far away. And so that's how far it, it takes for, for the, the balance to be achieved is the, the um, range of the uh, average range of secondary particles that are produced. Okay. So that's the relationship between absorbed dose and kerma. Kerma is a, a not a physical quantity that can be measured because we're, you, we can't, we have no means for measuring the kinetic energy transfer, but it's something we can calculate. Uh, we can measure the, the energy that's being deposited. Uh, and so that's what absorbed dose is, but it's harder to calculate in the buildup region. Um, the units for both are energy per unit mass. That's what we had back here in our thing. What is the, energy per unit mass. So we have the number of photons, the energy transferred by each photon <coughs> divided by the mass of the volume. So units, <coughs> excuse me, the units are joules per kilogram. And that has the special name was of the gray. One gray is one joule per kilogram. Um, for uh, photons, Everything we've done up to this point, we talked about photon energy in MeV. We talked about mu en in centimeters uh, per square centimeters per gram and density in grams per cubic centimeter. How do we get to these SI units of joules per kilogram? Well, if we know our fluence that has units of one over square centimeter, the energy is in MeV. Well, we want to convert the energy to joules 1.6022 times 10 to the minus 13 joules for each MeV. Mu is in centimeters square per gram. We need to convert the grams to kilograms. It's a thousand grams in a kilogram. The squared centimeters cancel out. Uh, so the MeVs cancel out, the grams cancel out, and the conversion factor from all of our units, our, our numbers that we use uh, from the, the tape, the charts that we've been looking at. We can convert that to joules per kilogram by 1.6022 times 10 to the minus 10 joules per kilogram multiplied by the fluence in the proper units and uh, the mass energy absorption coefficient and density in grams per cubic centimeter. I also want to mention there's a traditional unit. Those of you who work in the field know very well. We talk about units of, of absorbed dose in RADs. Uh, RAD is a... a, a also an abbreviation for radiation absorbed dose. It was uh, developed in the early days. Uh, ICRP 123 was uh, in about the time I was born, so many years ago. Uh, and it's based on CGS units. The ERG is the CGS units of energy. Gram is the CGS unit of mass. And it turns out that one rad is 0.01 gray, or one gray is 100 rads. Um, so it's an easy conversion. In the United States, we still love to use rads, um, but we also still love to talk about speeds in miles per hour instead of kilometers. So uh, we like our traditional units. I've already uh, stolen my own thunder on this. Absorbed dose is a measurable quantity. It's a physical quantity. 
It directly relates to radiation damage, how much energy is being deposited in a mass. But Kerma is very easy to calculate. It avoids all the complexities related with electron buildup. And the other uh, benefit of Kerma is it's conceptually related to another historical quantity, uh, the concept of exposure and the Rankin. So we're going to move to that now. Uh, early on, uh, in the very early days of radiation, they understood there were hazards associated with radiations. Many um, physicians and researchers would redden their hands. Erythema, erythemia is the condition of having red hands. And so they, they would talk about amounts of radiation in terms of an erythemia dose, and they would say, we should keep exposures to a tenth of an erythemia dose or things like that. Um, but how do you know how much that is if the only thing you're measuring is the redness of your hands? And so they just um, decided very early on that um, we could come up with a, a technique for measuring radiation. And the, what is it that we can do uh, uh, to measure, uh, to be able to measure ionizing radiation? Well, ionizing radiation ionizes things. And we have a very convenient uh, medium of air where we can collect charges relatively easily. So there's a device called an ionization chamber depicted on the right. It's simply a volume of air with a, a positive anode and a negative cathode within it as uh, the photon or charged particle passes through the volume. It creates ionization. Uh, this would be a charged particle because there's several of them. Photons only have one event, right? And then the electrons have events. So as the charged particle passes through, it would create several um, events. Uh, if a photon comes in, it would create an electron, which could then cause further ionization. But the energy deposited in the, the volume, uh, or the ionization that's created, uh, we can collect the, the charge that's created by applying a voltage. The electrons will tend to drift toward the positive end. The um, ions, uh, so air, nitrogen ions, oxygen ions, will tend to drift toward the they're not positive, they drift from the negative receptacle. And so we can measure the amount of charge that builds up there. Or we can, if we're looking at a rate, we can measure the, the current that passes through of one, and this is defined in terms of the charges of one side, not both the electrons and the ions, but typically we measure the charge of the ions, the electrons that are created. One Rankin is, was, again, CGS units, one electrostatic unit or stat coulomb of charge of one side per cubic centimeter of air at standard temperature and pressure. That was the definition. Uh, and so ionization of air is an easy phenomenon to, to understand. It's an easy uh, phenomenon to measure. And so that was the, the measure. And this was called the exposure dose. The unit of, of Rankin, um, uh, is let's convert it to, from CGS units to SI units, and let's get to energy deposition as, as, as well, okay? So let's first convert from uh, uh, CGS units from the centimeter gram second system to the uh, kilogram meter uh, second system of measures. So we know that one Rankin was one electrostatic unit per cubic centimeter. The conversion of one electrostatic unit is 3.33 times 10 to the minus 10 coulombs. The density of air at zero degrees. We've been dealing with the density of air at room temperature 1.205. The density of air at zero degrees is 1.293 uh, milligrams per cubic centimeter. So if we have one ESU per unit centimeter, uh, per cubic centimeter, that's the same as 3.336 times 10 to the minus 10 coulombs. And then there's a density of uh, 1.293 times 10 to the minus 3 grams per cubic centimeter. We'll convert that to kilograms. It turns out that one Rankin is 2.58 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs per kilogram. That's what the number is in uh, SI units. And so typically, um, Precise measurements are now reported in coulombs per kilogram of air. Um, and this, this you can see, is closely related to Kerma uh, 
uh, well, well, we'll see how now. How is Kerma related to, um, to, to the Rankin? Uh, the way we relate them is we recognize that on average in air, each, uh, the, the energy required to ionize a molecule is 33.97 electron volts per ion pair in air. So that's the work function or the, the binding energy, the ionization potential for, for air. Uh, and the charge for each um, ion pair that's produced, the electron, is 1.6022 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. So one Rankin had 2.58 10 to the minus 4 coulombs per kilogram. Each ionization pair is 1.602 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Uh, each ion requires 33.97 electron volts, and we need to convert electron volts to joules. So let's check our units. Coulombs cancel out, ion pairs cancel out, electron volts cancel out. We end up with um, uh, electron volts or oh, joules. We electron volts cancel out. We have joules per kilogram, 8.77 10 to the minus 3 joules per kil kilogram. So one. Rankin is equivalent to 8.77 milligray, 8.77 times 10 to the minus 3 gray, or 0 0.877 rads. So one Rankin is very close to a rad. And so in practice, in the field, when working, uh, it's very common to consider one Rankin to be the equivalent of a, a rad, or one Rankin to be the equivalent of uh, one centigrade. Very common. Okay. Now, we've been dealing with some of these concepts before. I'm going to go over a list of the uh, uh, quantities that we use in, in radiation dosimetry. Um, we have the particle rate, how many particles are emitted per unit second from a source, or how many particles uh, pass uh, uh, some reference point per unit time. And that's units of per second. That might be Becquerel's uh, how many times the, the yield. Um, the uh, photon influence is the number of particles uh, passing a, a cross-sectional area per unit uh, time. We dealt with this with our little differential before, uh, the number of particles per unit area. Particle flux is the time rate of change, or time rate of, of affluence. So it's the number of particles passing per unit area per unit time. Okay, we have a lowercase v for the rate and uppercase v for the uh, just the fluence. This is the fluence rate. Fluence rate is called flux. Now, just as we have the number of particles we're creating, we're going to talk about the energy rate that's being produced. So we have a certain number of Particles uh, created per second of energy E, that's the energy rate that's being produced. The energy fluence is the energy of the radiation times the fluence of the radiation. Sometimes it's used as a symbol of uppercase psi. Uh, the energy flux is the time rate of change of the fluence. Energy of the energy fluence, uh, it's uh, lowercase psi. In this font, they look very similar. But this one's uppercase and this one's lowercase. Okay, let's consider for a second the fluence at dose from a point source. So if we have a point source that's emitting radi uh, radiation in every direction, there are n particles that are emitted from that. Over a period of time, n particles pass out, maybe in a burst. Um, what is the fluence? Well, they're all passing through this sphere. The surface area of a sphere is uh, 4 pi r squared. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. The surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So all of them pass through that surface area. So what is the, the number per, per area is n divided by 4 pi r squared. So the dose is the fluence times the energy times mu over rho. Uh, and so the fluence is uh, 1 over r squared. So the dose is going to decrease as 1 over r squared. Same thing for, th and, and by the way, uh, from our last slide, phi times e is the same thing as psi, so we get it there. Okay, um, so um, let's consider it from, uh, in terms of rate. 
as n was the number of particles, we're going to talk about s, the number of particles per second, the particle per unit time. All of them pass through a sphere of 4 pi r squared. So the, flu the flux is the emission rate divided by 4 pi r squared. The dose rate, I'm using it, this little dash to indicate time rate, is the, uh, the same as psi mu over rho, or phi e mu over rho, energy absorption coefficient. Okay, um, once again, dose rate trails off as uh, 1 over r squared, just like the uh, that did. So the flux and the fluence increases 1 over r squared, and therefore the dose decreases as 1 over r squared. I think uh, this is a very common um, graphic that's used. If you think about a point source spreading out, that after a distance of some given distance, it goes to a certain surface area, for twice the distance away, there are four panes of glass, or four times as much surface area. If it's three times the original amount, it takes nine times the surface area, and therefore the dose is decreasing in the same way. And down in the bottom, you see that the dose is inversely related to the distance squared, and the dose rate is also inversely related to the distance squared. This is called the inverse square law. Okay, that's what we've had for the first segment of the video. Um, I am going to uh, stop the slide here uh, and then begin the second video. I'll redo that as well because I have slides for it that I didn't have last time. Uh, I hope this works well for you and have a great night.